On August 14th, just 82 days before the general election, John McCain released his technology platform, an extraordinarily important document, if only because of the extraordinary importance technology has to the nation's economy. This platform touted John McCain's experience, described him as the former chairman of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, a committee, the document notes, that plays a major role in the development of technology policy. And indeed, for much of the last decade, John McCain has led the most important committee in Congress dealing with Internet and technology matters. But that experience, in my view, brings with it a certain amount of responsibility. For the single most important fact about the Internet's development of the last decade has been the extraordinary decline the United States has faced with respect to our competitive partners. We started the Bush administration at number five. We will end at number 22. And the question anybody should be asking about Internet policy here is why we did so poorly and what change there might be to reverse that decline. How will we change this decline? And in particular, in evaluating John McCain's technology platform, we should be asking whether in his platform there's something new or something different from what he has been espousing to this date, something that might actually reverse the consequences of policies which he himself has been largely responsible for supporting. Now, as I evaluate his policy in light of this question, I just don't see it. I don't see what in this policy will affect a reverse in this decline. For example, he begins the platform by describing policies to, quote, encourage investment in innovation, essentially tax cuts, something we're very familiar with in the presidency of George Bush. He ends the platform by describing policies to, quote, ensure America is a connected nation. But these are basically policies to transfer money to corporations. For example, he describes a People Connect program that will reward companies offering high-speed Internet access service to low-income customers by allowing these companies to, quote, offset their tax liability for the cost of this service, subsidizing these companies to provide this service, a subsidy which former SEC Chairman Reed Hunt estimates will cost the government at least $8 billion for the top two providers of Internet service alone. All of these proposals are proposals to drive money to the largest companies in this sector, rather than driving competition to these companies to drive them to provide better, cheaper service. For the single defining feature of the last eight years has been the collapse in internet service provider competition. We began the Bush administration with literally thousands of ISPs, both narrowband and broadband ISPs. And we will end the administration with essentially two, if you're lucky, in any particular district. And this change is because of changes in government policy, changes that increasingly facilitated the consolidation of this market such that we don't have effective competition anymore. Governments that didn't adopt this change in policy, that stuck to the policy that was in the 1990s, achieved a very different reality for broadband penetration. For example, in France. In France right now, companies are offering triple play packages of 100 megabits per second, plus telephone, plus television for about $45 a month. In San Francisco, to get the exact same service, you got, have to pay twice that amount, and you get one-tenth the speed for Internet service. The reality is of a failure in these last eight years in broadband policy on John McCain's watch. But there is nothing in his proposals that will suffice to reverse this decline. One place John McCain's technology policy is quite explicit, though, is in the question of network neutrality, in his criticism of network neutrality. Now, what exactly does network neutrality mean here? Network neutrality is basically the question whether the network owners get to pick and choose the applications and content that you as a user can have access to or use. Now, if you thought about these networks in the way that you might think about a cable television network, you'd probably think, sure, why shouldn't they have that right? Just like a cable television network has the right to choose what programs will play across their television network. But if you think about the Internet more in the way we traditionally thought about telephones or telecom networks, 
then you would say, of course, no way should the network owner have the right to choose with whom I connect or what I say. And that's essentially the battle that's brewing around the question of the future of the Internet. Will the Internet increasingly look like cable television networks, where the owners of the network get to pick and choose the applications and content that run on that network? Or will the future of the Internet stay with the tradition of telephones, where it's the user that gets to pick with whom and what he says on that network? Now, the network operators here have a very clear view. They want the network to increasingly look like cable television. They say it's our pipes, or tubes as they describe it in Washington. They say we get to control which content and which applications get to run on those pipes. But network neutrality stands for a very different principle. It is that the consumer should have the right to choose. So just as with the telephone network, you get to call anyone and say anything so long as it's legal and connect whatever you want to that network, at least so long as it's not harmful, and rely upon important competition to keep the price low and the quality high, so too for the future of the Internet. We should have the right to access anyone, use anything that's legal, any application that's legal, attach whatever devices we want to this network so long as it's not harmful, and depend upon a context of competition to guarantee that prices remain low and quality remains high. Now, John McCain's policy initially makes it sound like he supports these freedoms. He says he will preserve consumer freedoms and identifies the freedom to access the content consumers choose, use the applications and services that consumers choose, attach the devices that consumers choose, and be free to choose among broadband service providers, presumably in a context of competition, to keep prices low and quality high. These, in fact, are four freedoms that were originally articulated by former FCC Chairman Michael Powell, the man said to have authored the technology platform that John McCain is now espousing. But Michael Powell never intended these principles to be enforceable. Instead, he believed in a faith that the companies providing access to the Internet would make that access contingent upon securing these freedoms. Now, that faith was tested for Michael Powell by a company called Madison River, a company that provided DSL service, but then decided to block voice over IP applications on their DSL service, requiring the FCC to step in and tell them to stop. The face was tested again when a band Pearl Jam, through its uh, lead singer Eddie Vedder, decided on a AT&T webcast to criticize the president and then found AT&T turned down the volume while Eddie Vedder criticized the president, again because AT&T presumably believes it's their platform, they have the right to control the content on that platform. Verizon had the same view when it decided to block pro-choice text messaging because it didn't believe that message was appropriate for its platform and exercised the power it believed it had to block content it didn't like. Like. And then BitTorrent found that Comcast was blocking its access to the network or its consumers' use of BitTorrent on the network because, again, Comcast believed this was not an application that was appropriate for that network. All of these uses interfering with consumer choice eventually led the FCC to say faith is not enough. And FC, the FCC chairman now in place, Chairman Kevin Martin, took the very brave step of turning these four principles into an enforceable rule of law. The rule of these four principles now says it is the principle of network neutrality that guarantees that people have access to the content and applications they want to choose, not the content and applications that the network provider chooses for them. Now, apparently, John McCain wants to return to faith. Apparently, he believes that these enforceable rules of consumer choice are not appropriate in the Internet context. He does not believe, his platform says, in prescriptive regulation like network neutrality. Now, this is first extraordinarily disappointing because it signals that the McCain campaign is rejecting the advice of extremely important advisors like Med Whitman, the former head of eBay. 
Just about two years ago, Meg Whitman led the fight in Silicon Valley to get Silicon Valley companies and users to support network neutrality regulation. As she described in a letter to users, quote, right now, the telephone and cable companies in control of Internet access are trying to use their enormous political muscle to dramatically change the Internet. It might be hard to believe, but lawmakers in Washington are seriously debating whether consumers should be free to use the Internet as they want in the future. Indeed, lo those lawmakers are uh, debating it, and John McCain has now embraced the idea that they should be free to use the Internet as they want, where they means the companies, not the consumers. Instead of supporting the consumers, now the campaign of John McCain is supporting the lobbyists who now work for his campaign, Rick Davis, Charles Black, and Tim McCone, who have worked for these very telecom companies and cable companies to fight any requirement that they let the consumers use the internet as consumers want. But second, this criticism of network neutrality is very deceiving. For network neutrality is not rightly described as prescriptive regulation. Network neutrality is the heart of how the Internet was designed. As I described this in testimony I gave in 2002 to John McCain's committee, I think the first testimony to refer to this concept of network neutrality, neutrality was at the very core of what the Internet originally stood for, meaning the Internet itself would not discriminate against applications and content. Instead, the applications and content that succeeded were the applications and content that consumers or users of the Internet enjoyed. That neutrality is what produced the incentive for the extraordinary growth that we saw in Internet usage and innovation, and it's that growth that defined the success of the original Internet. Neutrality is what the Internet was, and the question we now face is whether neutrality is what the Internet will be. And thus, defending net neutrality is to defend this tradition of uh, competition that created the original Internet, to defend it against the work of the lobbyists who increasingly want to see the power shift from the consumers to the network owners. They want to see the Internet in the model of cable television owned and controlled and thereby weakened. And the product of that weakening is partly what we've seen over the last eight years. John McCain has now picked sides in this debate. He has picked sides against the Internet, or as they call it down in Washington, the Internets. In the end, what a technology platform needed to do was to explain how we can make technology work for us and for our nation. And this is what, to me, was most exciting about Obama's technology policy. For in addition to outlining important principles around access and network neutrality, Barack Obama's policy advances ideas about how we can use technology differently. So, for example, he advances the idea of open source government, which commits not to making every agency in the government have a web page, but to making sure that agencies charged with releasing data do so in a standard, open format way, so that people and institutions who want to check and hold the government responsible can get access efficiently to that data and make sure that the government is doing the job it is set out to do. Or in the context of transparency, proposals about how government data be made available so that we can understand influences in policy and trace those influences back to those responsible for these changes in policy. Or a particularly geeky proposal that I find extraordinarily important, the idea of establishing a chief technology officer, a person not charged with the job of making sure that the servers run quickly and efficiently, but a person charged with making sure that the principles and values embedded in the technology of our government reflect the values of our nation. Someone to be charged with making sure that privacy and transparency and accountability and efficiency are built into how our technology in government works. These ideas are ideas about how we can use technology to do something different and better in government. And this is the sort of thing that the Obama campaign has advanced, but there's nowhere in McCain's technology 
platform. But what's needed as well, in my view, is a recognition of something fundamental about the last eight years. And that recognition, again, is captured in this single graph. A recognition that the last eight years have not been focused on advancing technology policy, and we must return to that commitment, a commitment alive and well during the last Clinton administration. But this is a more general point that seems to have been lost in this election. The last eight years have been marked with profound mistakes of judgment. This is a picture of one such mistake. This is a picture of another. And when we face mistakes in judgment, what we need are people to stand up and say, we made a mistake, or when responsible, to stand up and say, I made a mistake, and I take responsibility. But this is something we've not seen in this election so far. And whatever you think about this mistake, we should not be continuing this mistake. And we need people to recognize the last eight years as a mistake and to signal the change in policy they will implement. John McCain doesn't even see the last eight years as manifesting a mistake. Instead, he continues to serve as a cheerleader for the mistakes of President George Bush's administration. We need a change there. The net needs a change there. If we're going to realize the potential of this extraordinary infrastructure to create both jobs and economic growth and the potential to make government work better. This is Lawrence Lessig, and Barack Obama had nothing to do with this message.